Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for um, staying around. Um, but don't leave um, when I stop talking, because the best talk is going to be last with um, Sirona and, and Matt. Um, I'm going to talk about the topic of a better version of the healthcare system. And the message is that I think health coaches are the key to making the system work better. So those of you who were, who were here yesterday will um, we'll get the joke. If you weren't here yesterday, this is um, having a bit of a go at Dr. Matt Phillips, um, who talked about a seagull. And um, most of us in the room thought we were, he was talking about a seagull. Um, he was, in fact, uh, talking about a seagull. Um, if I've understood it correctly, the idea is that an A goal is a goal that is challenging, but we're pretty confident that we can achieve it. A B goal is a more challenging um, goal, um, and it's achievable but very difficult. An A goal is impossible. A seagull. A seagull. <laughs> a seagull. A seagull is an impossible goal. You know, so that was apparently quite a good speech. I have a dream, but clearly it should have been, I have a seagull. So, <laughs> and, um, and together we have a goal, which at the moment, I think from where we sit, it seems that it may almost be impossible. Um, but I don't believe it's impossible. I think it's actually a beagle. Um, and I'm going to present uh, an idea of how that, or one idea of how we might make that happen. So what I'm going to cover in the remaining uh, 27 minutes is um, we have a health system which is failing. Um, acknowledging the um, previous session, I think uh, I got a much more positive feeling um, after listening to that. Um, I've been looking at primary care anyway, and I've been pretty depressed about it. I think it is a system that's not meeting the needs of the community at all well, and equally it's not meeting the needs of the practitioners and the providers with um, clinician fatigue and clinician burnout and clinician apathy. Um, we're going to talk about some of those reasons. Um, some of the things which um, clients, um, please note that I hate the word patient um, and I vow never to use that word again. I don't think any of our clients should be patient. I think they should all be a pain in the ass. They should all be insisting that they receive the care that they deserve. The word patient, it comes from the Latin, Latin party and it sort of means to be subservient and to do as you're told. None of us should do that in the healthcare system. Um, what are some of the aspects of the solution? One simple example of a better system, and then how healthcare or how health coaches can be part of the solution. So, this is a multi choice question. Um, put your hand up if you believe the healthcare system is functioning well. Okay, put your hand up if you think the healthcare system is underperforming. Put your hand up if you think the healthcare system is broken. And put your hand up if you think we need new versions of the healthcare systems, augmenting the existing systems, and all of the above. And I think it's all of the above because I think if you look at secondary and tertiary care, I think they're doing their job of being the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, and cliff quite well. But most of us involved in primary care I think we're failing to be the ambulance at the top of the cliff. Again, I think that's where the health coaches are the solution. Now, any criticism I make is not provided, is not aimed at the healthcare providers. I do not think there's a single doctor or nurse or health coach or receptionist who is not a good person and is not trying to do the best that they can, but the system is not supporting people to be the best that they can be. 
Um, and I think that's one of the things we have to change. So no criticism of the clinicians at all. Uh, this is a picture of one of, one of my colleagues at her tea break. Um, she's, just, uh, <laughs> she's just had a series of 15-minute um, um, consultations, um, returned about 30 emails, answered about three phone calls, and sent a whole lot of texts um, all in the last hour. She's having a little bit of time out before she goes back um, to her afternoon session. And, you know, 15 minutes just isn't long enough. You know, in the last session, we spoke about um, how we should greet each other, and that involves learning the person's whakapapa, but equally sharing some of your own. You know, there is no way in 15 minutes that we can share any of who we are. You know, so 15 minutes isn't long enough to greet someone, let alone uh, take a history, perform an examination, uh, reach a diagnosis, discuss the treatment options, um, then decide on a treatment plan, and then put in place the behavioral changes that will be necessary to enact that. That does not happen in 15 minutes, I can guarantee it. Um, people say, I do not get to see my, I have to wait six weeks to see my doctor. Now, what I reckon, this is a brilliant strategy for a capitated practice. You know, either by the time that six weeks comes around, you're better, or you've gone to ED. So you don't actually have to see anyone. Um, so great strategy, take the money and you don't have to see anyone. Um, I want to see my doctor, and I hear that all the time, and that's because relationship is important. You know, that relationship that we create between two people is what people are craving, and they're not getting that. I want the options discussed. You know, people do not want to be told what to do, and every health coach here knows that that's just ain't going to work. You know, we need to ask the right questions. We need to discuss the options. We need to use the coach approach. And I don't feel welcome anymore. This is a post um, COVID sort of comment. Um, I think you all would have seen that um, scene from the North Shore where a woman went to have her smear in the garage with the yacht in the background with two people in full PPE. And I went, that looks like something at a horror movie. That doesn't look like the general practice that I know. And this is what we've told is the problem. Um, that's a, a picture of an um, older looking GP and apparently um, most of us are about to retire in the next 10 years and those that aren't say that they want to anyway. Um, so we have an aging workforce, we have increased paperwork, we have decreased access to medical care, there's increased complexity and demands, polypharmacy and medication is the third leading cause of preventable death. That's what um, we kind of told, I don't think that's getting to the cause of the cause of the cause of the problem whatsoever. I think those are downstream determinants. These are some of the upstream determinants um, that I've been thinking about. One, we are using an outdated model. Two, pharmaceutical companies have just too much influence. We are neglecting our values um, and we are not treating the cause of the problem or the cause of the cause of the problem, we're ignoring the upstream determinants. So let's have a look at some of these um, four issues. Now I've stolen um, this slide um, from Dr. Matt Phillips um, uh, without asking him. Um, <laughs> um, so the gentleman on the left, uh, that's Louis Pasteur, and Matt made the comment, um, we did the talk that we're about to give, and, um, and Matt made the comment that Louis Pasteur was his hero when he was eight years of age, and I said, well, Superman was mine, that's why I'm introducing you and you're giving the talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but less known as the gentleman um, on the right, so Louis Pasteur was born in 1822, that's 200 years ago. Uh, Antoine Beauchamp was about six years his senior, and these two gentlemen um, fought out an academic um, battle between the germ theory and the host theory or the terrain theory, which Matt is going to talk a lot more about. Um, he's going to talk about it in relation to uh, cancer predominantly. Yesterday you heard him talk about it in relation to Alzheimer's. Um, I'm largely talking about it in relation to the other metabolic diseases. 
Um, okay, so it basically was germ theory versus host theory. Um, this is my take on what uh, Louis Pasteur was saying. He said, bacteria and viruses are everywhere. They can make us sick at any time. We are vulnerable and at risk, so be afraid. However, vaccinations can protect us and antibiotics can cure us. If you trust in us, you no longer need to be afraid. Now, I don't think that was exactly what Louis Pasteur said. I'm, I'm suggesting that that's a modern interpretation and possibly the interpretation that we've seen over the last two years. Um, this is my interpretation of what Antoine Beauchamp was saying. He said, a healthy host is resistant to most germs. Your immune system is innately intelligent. You do not have to be afraid. You have personal control. Choose carefully and you won't get sick. There is no need to fear. This is what I think we haven't been seeing um, playing out over the last two years. This is how I'm seeing it um, playing out right now. I think that this is germ theory versus host theory, um, represented just by those two pictures, except I think the pictures are not the right size. I think that uh, one on the left-hand side should be a very, very big picture, and the one on the left-hand side at the moment is a very small picture. This is a David versus Goliath battle. Um, this is lifestyle medicine, which is young, um, represented by organizations such as Precure. And this is the pharmaceutical industry, which is massive, pervasive, and influences all aspects of healthcare. But I think that small is going to get bigger and get bigger very quickly. Um, and I think that will result in the pharmaceutical industry um, having a more contained um, influence. So I don't think that Pasteur was wrong and Beauchamp was correct, um, or the other way around. They were clearly both right. Um, but I think Louis Pasteur was more right in relation to what we're seeing on the top. So that's a um, picture of the Black Plague. Um, if my understanding is correct, I think about a third of Europe died during the Black Plague, and clearly people were very vulnerable um, to that organism. But we've moved away from the infectious disease period, and we're now in the chronic disease period. So what was appropriate 200 years ago is less appropriate nowadays. So we are, we're seeing a transition from predominantly infectious diseases to predominantly chronic lifestyle diseases. We need to transition our thinking from the germ theory to the host theory in order to appropriately manage these modern diseases. The old school approach of the past is no longer working. So about 70% of general practice consultations are for lifestyle diseases, 30% for the less, for the, um, the old-fashioned diseases, yet we're still using a germ theory type approach to manage these lifestyle diseases, and it's failing, it's not working. Now, we, we had a good go at preventative medicine. Um, so that's Jeffrey Rose, and in the 1980s, um, he was sort of one of the epidemiologists that talked about preventative health, but the idea was great, but the application was very, very poor. Because what ended up happening is we started identifying hypertension and treating it as a separate condition with medications. We identified high cholesterol, thought it was a separate condition, and we treated it separately. And we saw high glucose levels, we thought it was a separate condition, and we treated it separately, all with different medications. And Please note the way that I've spelt um, cure. Um, Louise and I, we had a discussion about that with Wendy last night. So um, 
The problem, I think, is that we're not actually curing people. So as an analogy, if you own a mechanics workshop and seven cars come in in the morning, you need seven cars to leave in the afternoon, don't you? If seven cars come in the morning and only six cars leave, it ends up looking like that. That's an overwhelmed mechanics workshop. It's not actually a, something else, but um, <laughs> that's what an overwhelmed mechanics workshop would look like, and that would be dysfunctional. That would not work. And that is what's happening to our healthcare system. You get a new diagnosis, you start on a medicine, the doctor says to you, never ever stop this medicine or you will have a stroke, and you remain in that healthcare system for your whole entire life until you die. There is only one way to leave that healthcare system, it's when you die. That is a surefire method of overwhelming a healthcare system and it's just not working. I've got the suggestion, what if we actually cured a few people? What if we actually made them better? It's basically the concept of my talk. What if instead of just starting them on medicines that deal with the symptoms, what if we actually made them better? You know, what if some of those cars actually left at the end of the day? And that's all that I'm suggesting. And I think it starts here. So just picture yourself. You've worked really, really hard all year. It's the 26th of December. The kids are in the car. The dog's in the car. Everything's on the roof rack. You're driving, and that symbol comes on. Okay. Don't you hate that, because I know most of you have experienced that. And you have two choices, don't you? One, you can pull over, uh, grab the little book and find out what it means. Or you can get a piece of black insulation tape. <laughs> okay? And you can put it over that, eh? Like, just put it over that, and the problem has gone away. Hasn't it? The problem is gone. That is exactly what we're doing with hypertension. Someone comes in with a warning sign of insulin resistance. We give them their first blood pressure medicine in a base. We bring them back in a week's time. Their blood pressure's gone down. We tap ourselves on the back, say, well done. That condition is solved with this medication. And we think we've done a great job and we have done the crappiest job possible because that was the warning sign for insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome and we missed the clue and we made the symbol go away. What we should have done, of course, is we should have had a conversation about the causes of their insulin resistance and fixed it. And I think it's like a gateway drug. You know this concept that your first puff of marijuana, um, six months later you're on heroin? You know? <laughs> your first capsule of inner base, Ten years later, you've got polypharmacy, don't you? You're on three blood pressure medicines. One of them is a diuretic, which causes diabetes. You're then on metformin, and then the, the J drug, which I actually have a, a, a moral objection to that, um, to the J drug. Um, then you're on insulin, and then you've got gout, and so you're on allopurinol, and, you know, it goes on. And we could have stopped it by, instead of giving the gateway drug, actually dealing with the cause of the problem. Now, um, I like the slide on the left. I hate that um, slide on the right, and I wish I hadn't put it in there because that's completely wrong. Um, one, that arrow with obesity, I think, is going the wrong way, and it should be on the other side, and it should just have food going in there on the right. But the point I'm trying to make is that insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome, or as Matt will talk about, mitochondrial dysfunction, that is the cause of the problem, and we need to deal with that and the causes of that, not the symptoms, with blood pressure drugs. So addressing the cause of the problem, not the symptoms only, and I reckon it can be summarized as easily as that, and Matt will go on and talk a little bit more about this, but we are eating the wrong foods and we are eating too often. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. Um, now, um, Jala, who's sitting in the background, um, I asked her if she would come up and, uh, and give this uh, little, little pardon. Uh, she, she's shy, which is, which is quite unusual for a radio host, but anyway. Um, so Jala is our, our um, head coach, 
Um, and you all know what health coaches um, do, working on the client's agenda, non-judgmental, individualised programmes, um, recognising that behavioural change can be difficult and that the client is the expert in their own health. So I think that's what we need to introduce to deal with the cause of the problem. There's Jala. Um, how will health coaches be the solution? Um, we do not have enough doctors and nurses we need to introduce a whole nother team to this healthcare team who are trained in nutrition and behavioural change, um, who can work as part of the team to deal with the cause of the problem. I think health coaches are the solution. They're ideally trained to deal with metabolic syndrome. They're trained in nutrition and behavioural change, um, and they can work as part of a team. Now, um, this um, is an idea that um, we've been playing with, um, uh, and Precure has, um, Etienne, if Etienne's here, um, has, has done the word processing, because when I did it, it was a hand-drawn um, picture. Yeah. So um, this is an idea that I think um, is important. So um, this up here in black, um, the standard American diet, the standard Australian diet, the standard RTRO diet, um, whatever you want to call it, it's sad and that um, when the slide goes to its next version that will just disappear off because that should, shouldn't even be there, no one should be eating crap like that. Then you come down to the standard American diet, improved. And I like this concept, you know, you might say to someone, just stop soft drinks. You know, you might say nothing more than that. You might even do that in a text. I've seen someone reverse their diabetes after a text which said stop eating sugar, you know. So you might just do that. Then you might come down, standard American diet improved, also stop takeaways. Um, then we come down to the balanced health, the balanced um, plate or the healthy plate model. And I just want to focus on that a little bit. I don't think that is going to cure diabetes. You know, I think that is a public health message for how people should stay well. My um, problem is that I think there are many dietitians and nutritionists who think that is a medical nutrition therapy. I think for most people it's not strong enough. We need to move down a little bit. So how about the balanced plate avoiding snacking? A whole food diet where all food is prepared from home. Um, no white carbs, a whole food diet, add healthy fats uh, and avoid the vegetable oils, low carb diet, and then we get down to keto. So as you notice, as it comes down, um, it's getting smaller and that's because I think there are less people that need to um, be doing these interventions down here. Um, keto with intermittent fasting, two meals a day, 16-8, uh, advanced 16-8, which means eating um, in daylight hours, one meal a day, 36 hour fast, 48, 72, and then longer fasts. You know, these medical nutrition therapies are powerful. This is the chemotherapy of, of diseases. You know, and there may be some deficits in these um, approaches at the bottom, just like chemotherapy is not necessarily healthy. And you wouldn't take chemotherapy if you were well, I suspect there's not as many people that need to be down this end, and most people need to be up here. But if you are dealing with these conditions, cancer, autoimmune conditions, and neurological conditions, I think that you need more intensive therapies than you do if you were perhaps looking at weight loss. Um, so do you get the concept? Is that a, a useful sort of concept? And I really like it because I kind of look at what the person's got and I sort of think how intense do we need to be in order to deal with this problem and the next talk um, we're going to be talking down here the pointy end of this pyramid uh, where we've got a really significant metabolic condition that needs some hardcore um, medical nutrition therapy. Um, I'll just go through these very quickly because you all know this, but I, I do notice that sometimes we get into the really hardcore technical stuff and we forget to deal with the really simple um, aspects of lifestyle medicine. So it means healthy eating, 
Um, reduce the consumption of ultra-processed foods um, by teaching knowledge and skills required to follow healthier eating patterns of a person's own choosing. Okay. Um, as you've heard um, said many times, um, exercise is medicine, so physical activity. Um, I see it mainly as a medical health, um, uh, a mental health tool. I think it is less um, effective as a weight loss tool. Um, brain cleansing. Um, this uh, comes from a lot of Grant's work. Um, to think of sleep as washing your brain. Um, I understand from Grant that the glymphatic channels increase in capacity four times. You can wash the glutamate out of your brain. Uh, also helps to wash um, some of uh, the proteins that build up in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, healthy relationships are important and what we are building here is a community. And I think, um, I think we are experiencing medicine right now um, being part of this community of like-minded people. Um, mental health and some of the things on here have been discussed in detail. Um, the role of supplements, uh, Julia Rutledge discussed that um, uh, yesterday. Uh, exercise, sleep, cold water immersion, I think uh, that's one of Grant's favorite um, topics. Um, and some people are smiling and many people are shivering. Um, the microbiome discussed earlier. Um, yeah, so that's mental health. But I think in summary, you know, we need both. Um, I don't think we should be chucking out the germ theory. I don't think we should be chucking out um, all medicines. Um, I think we just need to be using the medications more appropriately. Um, and I think we need both lifestyle medicine and pharmaceutical medicine. Um, and we need to take the best from both approaches. Now, um, this is our version of a better version of the healthcare system. Um, and I think there need to be many better versions of the healthcare system. I hope that there will be hundreds of attempts at better versions. And we can copy the best from... Um, from everyone's version and together, collectively by trial and error, we can create better versions of the healthcare system. So um, 30 minutes is a minimum appointment time. Um, I think that's a given. I used to have 3,000 um, clients that I cared for in my general practice. That was crazy. There was no way that I could have done that. I think 500 is about the maximum that any general practitioner should try and look after. I think um, health coaches need to be the main part of providing health care. We need to use medical nutrition therapies as first-line treatments, and we need to have a variety of medical nutrition therapies in our toolbox. You know, we need to understand keto, low-carb, intermittent fasting, um, low-fat vegan, um, and all the others, and then we need to understand how to make them culturally appropriate. Um, and I think that's important, but, you know, I've been struggling with Indian cuisine. You know, um, I find it difficult to make that culturally appropriate um, on a low-carb or keto diet, even though um, Indian men have some of the highest um, rates of diabetes in New Zealand. Um, Medications are still important, and I did even prescribe that J-drug um, once, you know, so they have a place. Can I ask a question? What's the J-drug? <laughs> <laughs> so the, it's Jardiance or Empagliflozone. Um, the reason I have a moral objection to it is that it allows you to keep taking in the glucose, and you, pay, you can pee out 60% of it. I think of that story of the Roman vomitorium. You... you Overconsume food and then you vomit so that you can eat some more. I'm kind of going, you know, it just seems morally wrong. We should be just reducing the consumption of these ultra processed carbs. Why don't you tell them what you called it in the GP's conference? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, 
someone was sitting right in the, the front and I was talking about this and she got up and stormed out and I thought she may have been the pharmaceutical rep for Jardians, but I, um, I think it was the reference to sticky genitals that, um, <laughs> that caused her to storm out. I was told not to say that, thanks Grant. <laughs> So in summary, uh, the health system is failing to meet the needs of our clients or customers. Um, we need to be addressing the cause of the problem and not just the symptoms. Um, we need to have many better versions of the healthcare system. Um, our private general practice, Reversal NZ, is, is one, one example of that. There needs to be many, many versions. And the health coaches will be at the center of this, these new versions of the healthcare system because health coaches are ideally placed because they understand nutrition and they understand behavioral change and that is the key to reversing chronic health conditions. And that is the end of my talk and I'm on time. <laughs>